Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Rajiv Bajakal. Bajakal, I'm so sorry, tomato, tomato, but I, I, I practiced, I practiced, and of course I blew it. I got to think magical rhymes with magical. <laughs> anyway, but it's so interesting because we just had his wife, who's also a doctor on his show last week, and his daughter has been on, who's a nutritionist. So the whole family is into healthy eating and healthy living. He's an orthopedic surgeon, and I can't wait to hear all about bone health. Please welcome him to the show. I'm so sorry. I practiced your name a million times and I get so I nervous. think you've said it better than most people do. So don't don't apologize at all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, this I, I I can't wait to for you to tell the viewers your story. But my favorite part is you walk your dogs a lot. And I appreciate that. <laughs> yes, I love love doing that. That's my favorite time of the day, really. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I this uh, I was I was told to ask you about your cooking. Are you a good cook? Well, uh, my wife tells me I am, but I suspect it's because she likes to keep me in the kitchen now. Um, now that she's enjoyed my cooking over lockdown and the period where I really took to it, um, I, I enjoy cooking. I must admit, uh, I find it very relaxing. And especially, um, you know, if, if I have a couple of hours, I, I absolutely love doing it. And uh, now that I've, uh, uh, I've enjoyed this lovely kind of cuisine that we eat of a whole food plant-based diet, I can experiment with so many things and really get some good food on the table. Yes. That's fantastic. I'd love to hear your story because from my understanding, you reversed your diabetes, you lost weight. So tell us about when you first discovered a plant-based diet. Was your daughter the one that inspired you at first? Well, I must say my, um, my youngest daughter, Naina, who actually is a, an executive with Time Magazine in New York right now, um, she became an ethical vegan about probably about 18 years ago now. And she introduced us all to the, the concept of, uh, of eating in a vegan way. But my wife took to that almost instantly and uh, started cooking healthier for all of us at home. Um, but really, I, um, I felt I'd be a bit of an outcast in orthopedics uh, in, uh, because most of my colleagues ate a lot of meat and chicken. And so I stuck it out by just being pescatarian for the first very many years. And it was only in 2016 um, that I started realizing that I'd really piled on a lot more weight than I needed to be at. So I was well over 230 uh, pounds, two, 240 pounds at one point. So. 108 kilograms in uh, in what we use in Britain. And uh, I, I was diabetic at that stage and I was just about to be put on medication. Um, I actually had a very unfortunate incident where I was driving my wife um, to a dinner over the Christmas period. Uh, and uh, my eyesight had been getting worse, which I just thought, you know, I probably need some glasses, uh, but I failed to see a lamppost and nearly drove into it. And she was having a nap in the front seat because she was very tired. And she woke up suddenly to see that I was heading towards the lamppost. And that was quite frightening. So I went on to this dinner where there was a friend who was an ophthalmic surgeon, ex-ophthalmic surgeon, actually. And I said, I narrated the story to him. So he brought out his iPhone torch and shone it into my eyes and uh, told me you have cataracts in both eyes. So not only did I have cataract, but uh, I had a frozen shoulder at that point, which was clearly linked to my diabetes. And uh, I was pretty despondent. So I ended up having cataract surgery. I felt my career could be uh, on, a, on a very fragile thread there because as a spinal surgeon, if you don't have good eyesight, you really can't function. Um, and when I was recovering from this, I just happened to chance upon a documentary in 2017, uh, Forks Over Knives. 
And I instantly changed overnight to a healthier plant-based diet. Um, I had already actually embarked on a program of exercise and caloric restriction, so I was eating much less than before, and I'd managed to lose quite a bit of weight. But when I saw this documentary, it inspired me. Um, and, and you had a role in that also, I think, Chef AJ. And it, you know, I got into watching a lot of YouTube videos. I learned about caloric density from one of your YouTube movies a, a while ago. Um, and really it helped me because I shed another 30 odd pounds and managed to, um, to completely improve my diabetic markers. And I would say it was, uh, I was clearly in remission at that point. And for three years now, I've, uh, I've not crept into the pre-diabetic range. So I'm very, very happy with, with the way, uh, with what the diet has done for me or this way of life has done for me. I uh, also have boundless energy and uh, all those other things that I had of aches and pains here and there and a frozen shoulder, all that reversed quite quickly. When you said the frozen shoulder was tied to your diabetes, how, how is that work? Um, well, frozen shoulder is much more common in people with diabetes. Uh, in fact, they quite often get a frozen shoulder on both sides. And that should alert any orthopedic surgeon to test for diabetes. I mean, frozen shoulder is a peculiar condition. It's adhesive capsulitis is the technical name for it. But it's an inflammatory condition. It seems to, there seems to be a contractile collagen in the shoulder joint. And you really lose um, all your movements. So there's a global restriction of movements. You cannot move, you, you cannot reach overhead, but you can't also scratch behind your back. Uh, and really it's a painful condition because you can't sleep at night, it often wakes you up. And yes, there is a strong link to diabetes. So I was clearly getting some of the complications that one does get with diabetes at that stage. I did not know that, that that's very interesting. So your di would you say your diabetes is gone, managed, reversed? Um, well, I'd love to say reversed. The, the preferred term is remission these days, but I suppose they use that term cautiously because one doesn't know how much damage has already occurred to the beta cells of the pancreas, which is where insulin is produced. And um, I know, I mean, there's several different uh, definitions of it. The vast majority of people who get what is called type 2 diabetes, which is maturity onset diabetes or diabetes that occurs later on in life, get it because of insulin resistance in their tissues, which means uh, quite simply, insulin is not doing its job of moving glucose into the cells. Um, but there are other people, and especially in the South Asian um, population, uh, where our beta cells uh, are smaller in number and they really fatigue and they can get damaged by the dietary excesses that one has. Uh, and so uh, your insulin production itself may go down hugely. So I hesitate to use the word remission, but, or, or uh, sorry, hate to use the word reversal, but I'm pretty confident that on my kind of diet as I am right now, uh, and for three years now in succession, I've had such excellent markers that my, my doctor, my family physician is very impressed with it all. In fact, I just had, because I turned 60 quite recently, had another set of blood tests and my HbA1c is 38, which is, which is well below uh, the range for pre-diabetic numbers, I would say. Fantastic. Have any of your med medical colleagues uh, heard your story and have any of them changed their diet in a more favorable way since hearing about it? Yes, I mean, uh, various people have been impressed by certain aspects of, uh, of the diet and the results. Uh, a colleague of mine who's uh, uh, South African, actually, and, uh, um, you know, he was brought up eating meat and he would eat uh, things like biltong, for instance, which is dried meat uh, quite regularly as a snack, just as you may have a a piece of fruit or 
you know, a, a dried fig or something as a snack, he would snack on biltong. Uh, and then he heard my story and he realized that his cholesterol markers were going up hugely and he was in danger. His, his doctor had told him to eat a healthier diet, but most doctors don't know what a healthier diet is. They just use the term nebulously. So um, he didn't really know what to do. And when he heard my story, he was inspired and he's now changed to a whole food plant-based diet for the past year and a half. Uh, I actually put a challenge to him that if he could do it for a couple of weeks, um, and he accepted the challenge. He thought he'd return after two weeks and tell me what a waste of time that was. You know, I feel awful, I feel weak and I'm protein deficient and the usual kind of things that one hears uh, from people who aren't on a plant-based diet. But in fact, he met me four weeks later and said, uh, you know, this thing you were talking about, I've, uh, you know, I've lost uh, six pounds in weight already and my cholesterol markers have improved quite a lot. So he's taken to it and quite a few other colleagues are certainly inching their way towards a, a whole food plant-based diet. What about your patients? Is, is this something you're able to share with your patients? Yes, I think, uh, I mean, uh, following my own successes with it, I felt it wasn't enough to just, uh, uh, I mean, N is equal to one doesn't make for a great uh, study. And although it makes for a good story, to tell others about, I felt to scale it up, I needed to improve my knowledge about lifestyle medicine. And therefore um, I went firstly on, I met some, some friends in China who had been on the holistic holiday at sea. Uh, and so I went on the cruise myself in 27, uh, 2018 and 2019. Um, and I learned all about a whole food plant-based diet. And I also learned how to do the lifestyle medicine course with the American College of uh, Lifestyle Medicine Physicians. So I've done a diploma, same as my wife Neetu has, uh, and we're qualified in, in this. And we can now actually scale it up quite a bit because we can talk to patients about a healthier lifestyle and a much healthier diet. And that I think is much more rewarding because uh, especially in the kind of field I am, and I do a lot of spinal surgery, uh, I find when patients lose quite a bit of their weight and improve their strength in their back and uh, so on, they don't often need the kind of operations that they would have required otherwise. So it's, it's a gratifying way to get people a lot better. That's fantastic. I don't think a lot of orthopedic surgeons ever share any type of dietary advice with their patients. Absolutely not. I, I think it's uh, it's quite unique. And my website uh, has quite a lot of information on a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, and it's linked to my daughter, who you talked about, you know, uh, uh, Rohini, who's a nutritionist, uh, and my wife, Neetu, who's a gynecologist. So as a family, we're quite into this as a group. And I, th I think it's much easier when the whole family adopts the whole food plant-based diet than rather than having two or three ways of cooking for people who don't want to change their ways. And we've all felt enormous health benefits from it all. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, I know that your wife and your daughter wrote a book. Are you going to write a book on bone health, osteoporosis, plant-based diet? I do intend to. Well, I'll first start, I think I've written a chapter now for uh, our plant-based health professionals uh, in the UK. And we actually have a website, plant-based health professionals, uh, UK. And there's a lot of information, infographics on that about osteoporosis. I've written a chapter for, for a book with them, but I intend to write a book on bone health, but perhaps also extend it into back pain uh, and common problems of the back that occur, such as sciatica, which are also, I think, linked uh, in, in part, at least, to the kind of food we eat, but also the healthy lifestyle habits that we all adopt. Yeah, that, that, that is, what is the most common thing you see and treat? Um, I would say the, vast, the acutely uh, the painful condition that people come to me is often sciatica. So they often have uh, pretty miserable pain going down the leg. People are in agony with it. Uh, and it's often due to a slipped disc in their back, which is sitting on a nerve. So I've got a little model over here, which kind of shows what happens. So 
if you look at this, this is the disc, the intervertebral disc between the vertebrae and the jelly-like portion inside, which is called the nucleus pulposus, pops out and it sits on these little yellow nerves that run down to the leg. Uh, and that, so you get pain that actually shoots all the way down the leg. Uh, and that's what we call sciatica because it's along the distribution of the sciatic nerve, which supplies the hamstrings and the, the muscles below the knee. So that can be a pretty miserable condition. It's very, very painful. Um, patients are often desperate to get some immediate relief, but also to get lasting uh, relief of their symptoms. So that is probably the commonest thing I see. But I also see a lot of people who have uh, other conditions such as osteoporosis uh, and who get uh, osteoporotic fractures. Um, and probably another condition that occurs more commonly in older people is spinal stenosis where uh, bone gradually grows onto the nerves. They, it grows inward, so the spinal canal becomes narrower. So the space available for the spinal cord becomes much narrower and people get a symptom called claudication. So as they walk any distance, they really have to look for places to sit down to get some relief of this horrible pain that can be quite debilitating. So those three are the commonest conditions, besides which I commonly see some worried well people who, uh, who have back pain, which if you look at the global burden of uh, health, uh, back pain is the leading cause of disability uh, and neck pain is fourth in the, in the rank there. So even ahead of headaches and so on. So, these two uh, causes are so common in the population that it's estimated, I think about 70 to 80% of the world's population would have had back pain at some point in the past. And most people have an acute presentation, so it's quite disabling, and they often come want to see a, a surgeon about it to get a, a proper opinion and find a, a remedial course of action. And it lends itself quite nicely, I think, into dietary advice, but also exercise on how to strengthen their back, how to get more active. And I think often it's a domino effect. So if somebody changes their diet to a much healthier diet, a whole food plant-based diet, or leaning towards more plants in their diet, they find their energy levels go up and it lends itself quite easily for them to go on to a more exercise-based uh, pattern and strengthen their back so that they don't keep getting these recurrent problems. That's interesting that you said back pain was the number one cause of disability. That does make sense. You know, it's interesting on your website, you say most back problems can be treated without surgery. <laughs> Absolutely true. It's a lifestyle related disorder. Uh, and, um, you know, while people, when they're in an acute amount of pain, you obviously need to do something for them so that they get out of that awfully painful condition. And sciatica, as I said, is a horribly painful condition. So um, I don't start by, you know, I mean, when you have a forest fire, you don't start growing new trees in the forest. You have to put out the forest fire first. So I usually um, will offer them some help to get control of their pain. So quite often an injection into the back, an epidural steroid or something, will just tide over the immediate crisis. But right at the beginning, I would tell people that they need to change their lifestyle, eat more healthy diets, exercise much more, get much more active and strengthen their back so that this doesn't keep coming back. Um, because really it's uh, the industrial revolution and our sedentary jobs that result in us sitting for very long periods of time that results to a lot of these backache problems. And people think um, exercise means walking 50 yards to the train station or uh, you know, walking a little bit around the house, but that isn't really exercise or activity. Um, so I think it's, it's important to recognize that back problems are usually caused by lifestyle excesses. Uh, and uh, I really talk to them about that. So if somebody wants an operation for a simple back condition, uh, they, they really have to 
justify that they have tried the lifestyle approaches and the dietary changes that are sometimes required to help themselves. So I often see people who are carrying a lot of excess weight and they have to at least acknowledge the fact that that is part of the problem and they'll address that. Uh, yes, as I said, it's important to get patients out of their acutely painful condition and I will do that. I will do everything to get them out of their initial stage of misery but then the rest of the walk, they have to walk with me and do something for themselves. Great, thank you. Um, we have some questions that were sent in and also some that are being asked live. Would you mind answering a few questions? No, I'd love to, yes. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, who's watching live says, have you seen much success with orthopedic patients who opt for stem cell replacement to growing cartilage in the knees? And is this becoming accepted as an option in the orthopedic world? Uh, thank you, Kathy, for asking that. It's, it's, uh, I must admit, it's not my area of specialization, but it is an area which is generating a lot of interest. So certainly stem cell research is, uh, is going forward on that. But, um, but like I said, I mean, those are exciting developments, but the basis has to be right. So even when people undergo bariatric surgery in a lot of areas, so they undergo surgery for being overweight, they often have to demonstrate that they are willing to make changes in their dietary plans, that they, they can eat a caloric restricted diet. Similarly, I would say, even if there's a lot of excitement generated by these plans, one would have to demonstrate that they are making changes in their lifestyle so that the arthritic changes in their joints can improve with these treatments. Um, I think it's still early stages, but stem cell research is a promising area for knee osteoarthritis in particular. Well, you know, you mentioned excess weight. How much of orthopedic problems and surgeries could possibly be ameliorated if people did find a more ideal weight? Um, a, a, a lot of problems. I mean, if you look at uh, the common changes, I mean, uh, the, the problems when I started training were in fact of undernutrition or deficiency issues. So you were, you know, we were taught about deficiencies of various vitamins and, uh, you know, if you had a, a vitamin D deficiency, for instance, you'd get rickets and others. But uh, what we're growing up now in, in the West, but as long as, you know, but also in developing countries, which are becoming more prosperous, you're seeing problems of excess. So um, really caloric excess is becoming very common, particularly in the West, where I would say um, being overweight or obese is, you know, is affecting at least 60% of the population in the United Kingdom, probably similar or higher numbers in the United States. Um, and it's, it's not just the fact that you're carrying excess weight, but um, carrying excess weight in your abdominal area, particularly in your around your viscera or your organs is inflammatory. And a lot of the problems that you see in orthopedics are related to this generalized inflammatory state. So uh, even though osteoarthritis, for instance, which is um, commonly called degenerative osteoarthritis, there is clearly an inflammatory component to it. And that is as a result of carrying excess weight. Besides the, the fact that a lot of this excess weight does transmit through the joints. So your hip joint and knee joint, uh, pl plus of course your spine are subjected to these excessive loads. And I think one has to recognize that a lot of these things go hand in hand. So when you're carrying excess weight and are very overweight, there's also problems with your vascular system. So you often get uh, atherosclerosis. You're, as Thomas Sydenham, uh, a, a surgeon in, uh, in England said, uh, I think it was a couple of centuries ago, you are as old as your arteries. So if your arteries are beginning to show signs of atherosclerosis and therefore circulatory damage, that damage will also occur in your joints it'll occur in your back to your discs and around that area. So it's quite common that a lot of these changes go hand in hand with, uh, with 
uh, a generalized inflammatory process such as which occurs in people who are overweight. Hey, thanks. What do you think of that some people say that vegans have a higher incidence of bone fracture? Is that accurate? Um, well, there have been some interesting new, new work which has come out from the Epic Oxford study. I think it came on last year, which caused a lot of anxiety uh, amongst people who were following a vegan diet. And that, is, that was a cohort study. So it, uh, it said that vegans, uh, I mean, the numbers sound astounding when you see it. So I think it was something like 50% more chance of hip fractures. But if you actually look at uh, the data itself, um, it, it meant 17 uh, out of a thousand people, thousand vegans would have a higher incidence of hip fractures in over a 10 year period. So it's not that big a number, but nonetheless, this study is a good study. It was done on, a, on people, uh, on a fairly large number of uh, vegans in the United Kingdom. There were some clear problems in the study and it was, remember, an epidemiological study. So obviously uh, it's difficult to, to say there's a definite causation, but one can attribute some of the problems uh, uh, that were there in this study to the deficiencies in the diet. In fact, people were studied from 1996 or 97, I think onwards, at which point we didn't know enough about the whole food plant-based diet. Uh, people in the United Kingdom were generally following it uh, as ethical vegans. So they really were not supplementing. A lot of them didn't take the required amount of vitamin D, for instance. And remember, we are north of the 40 degree latitude. So the amount of sunlight we get is much less. So we don't make enough vitamin D, especially if you're, uh, you have pigmented skin or if you're darker skin. Uh, but exposure to sunlight is not good enough for us and you have to supplement your vitamin D. There, were, there was also no uh, record of how much, whether they were taking vitamin B12. And vitamin B12, all of us know, uh, all of us who follow a healthier vegan diet or a plant-based diet, know that you have to really supplement vitamin B12 because that is made by bacteria in the soil and with the kind of sterile environment that we live in, we just don't get enough vitamin B12 in our diet and we have to take a daily supplement. So those three issues weren't corrected or accounted for, they weren't looked at in the EPIC Oxford study. Uh, a similar such study amongst the Adventists uh, in North America uh, also found a slightly higher rate of fractures and these were, by the way, all these studies have pointed to women um, over the age of, you know, postmenopausal women in particular. And we all know that vegans in general don't like taking supplements. So they were probably not taking the HRT also. And HRT was a factor that a lot of uh, um, you know, people who are non-vegans do, do take quite readily to avoid the, you know, the problems around menopause. So there were a lot of deficiencies, but nonetheless, it did draw attention to the fact that uh, one needs to do more exercise, especially muscle building exercise, because that also makes your bones stronger. And also, I think, coming on the lower end of the BMI, so in other words, a BMI less than 21 seemed to relate or correlate higher to fractures or hip fractures. I think one of the main things uh, that I'd just look, like to bring uh, your listeners uh, to realize that, uh, you know, yes, it is a big worry when people get a higher incidence of hip fractures. Hip fractures can be dangerous and uh, often 20% of people will die during the first six months after a hip fracture. And as, as high as a third often pass away in a year. So there are problems with this, but often it is because of associated comorbidities that people have. So often they have uh, uh, hypertension, they have had a stroke, or they have other problems with kidney disease, uh, fatty liver disorder, obesity, 
um, and a variety of other things, including diabetes. So uh, with all those comorbidities, if you have a hip fracture, it's much more dangerous. And I think even though vegans were found to have a higher incidence of hip fractures, I don't think they would have slipped into uh, the abyss that often uh, surrounds uh, the, the people who have a hip fracture in their later years. So I would, uh, I, I would take some good lessons from it, namely that we need to supplement our diet with B12 and vitamin D. Also, we need to do a lot more resistance training and exercise against gravity. So really exercise that builds our muscle mass is much more useful um, and will prevent fractures in, in uh, a population that eats more of a healthy plant-based diet. Great, thank you. How long did it take you to reverse your diabetes? Um, it took me, well, uh, prior to being, um, to, uh, to going on to a whole food plant-based diet, which I started back in July, 2017, um, prior to that, I was eating largely uh, a vegan diet, but I was uh, consuming some um, eggs, a little bit of dairy and some fish, uh, but I was very calorically restricted for about six months or so. Uh, and I dropped a lot of weight during that time. But in fact, despite dropping a lot of weight or losing a lot of weight, my diabetic markers got a lot worse during that period. Um, so it was when I went on to a whole food plant-based diet that within six months, I was able to go into a complete remission. And I saw my HbA1c come back to a normal level. And it's been a normal level for the past uh, three and a half years now. That's fantastic. Let's see, we've got so many questions when we have a doctor on, it's wonderful. Let me get to the next one. It is, sorry, my chat goes a little bit faster than everyone else's. I see there's a lot of them on osteoporosis. So we'll start with the first one from Elizabeth. What special diet is needed to prevent it? And maybe you could add if somebody already is diagnosed with it, is there certain foods they should be eating? Yes, I think um, you, you have to look at it. Uh, well, I tend to look at it as a macronutrients and micronutrients. So, um, I mean, everybody's heard the term that milk is good for you. And so let's start with protein, which is obviously important for your bones because it forms most of the matrix uh, into which bone is, or calcium is deposited. So um, on a plant-based diet, I would certainly recommend uh, at least two to three portions of soya. And soya seems to have a bad press in general has a bad uh, PR agent, I would say, but soy is especially the less um, processed forms of soya are particularly good because they have a very high quality protein. And in fact, if you take egg white as the standard so, sort of gold standard to look at in terms of the balance of the essential amino acids, which we have to consume because we don't make them, um, then soya um, in particular has the same complement of essential amino acid. Soya and quinoa are the two excellent sources of protein uh, in a plant-based diet. So I would recommend two to three portions of soya and it's now universally available. So although it started much more in China and uh, the Southeast Asian countries, it's entered our diets quite regularly and most of us are aware of how to get it. Um, a lot of the soy products that we have actually are uh, enriched with calcium. So uh, in the United Kingdom and in Europe, if they're labeled organic, you're not allowed to add calcium as a supplement, but most soy products um, uh, will have uh, added calcium if it's not labeled organic in, in Europe. Uh, but in America, you can easily see whether they have added calcium, for instance. Soy milk uh, is often enriched with calcium, with vitamin, uh, vitamin D, and also B12 to quite an extent. So these are complete foods. Uh, they also 
um, I mean, the less processed forms of soya, such as tempeh or tofu, tofu, especially if it's calcium set tofu, um, is a very rich source of calcium. So uh, in addition to being a rich source of protein, tempeh, on the other hand, is uh, doesn't, doesn't have as much calcium in it, uh, but it has 20 grams of uh, protein for every 100 grams of tempeh that you consume. But I think the focus should also look at uh, a variety of other foods. It's not just soya for the fact that they have protein and quite a lot of calcium, but they also have these very interesting uh, substances called phytoestrogens. Uh, and I'll just draw attention to that. There, um, there are at least three of them, but the, the popular or the, the more important ones are uh, date zen and uh, genistein. And these are what are called selective estrogen receptor modulators. So they have a greater degree of affinity towards the bone, uh, bone receptors. So the beta receptors, which are in bone, uh, and they have about 30% of the efficacy of normal estradiol or estradiol, which is the estrogens that women produce. So 30% of the efficacy on bone but only 1% will act, uh, one, so one in thousand efficacy on the alpha receptors, which are breast tissue, for instance. So the risks on the breast are lowered because it tends to block uh, the, estro the alpha receptors effectively by having an effect of only one in thousand of estradiol, but it's very strongly bone promoting. It's also muscle promoting, so these, uh, I can't sing enough praises of soya, but for, for some reason, if you are allergic to soya, uh, it's important to think of other beans. So chickpeas, uh, other beans, any of the beans, kidney beans, black beans. Uh, I mean, these are wonderful sources of protein. They also have a lot of fiber, which is good for bone formation. Uh, they're also pretty good as sources of calcium. If, if we look at cow's milk, only about 25 to 30% of the calcium is bioavailable or absorbed. Whereas um, calcium from plant sources often have a higher rate of uh, availability. So even though soya is quite rich in oxalates and phytates, the amount of calcium that you can absorb from soya is, is very good. So it's bioavailable. So for these reasons, I would certainly recommend as a macronutrient source and a micronutrient source, soya or other legumes. Besides that, we can get calcium quite adequately from green leafy vegetables. So um, I notice uh, you, you write love and kale, Chef AJ, and kale is a wonderful source, as is uh, broccoli um, or arugula or rocket, as we call it in, in the United Kingdom. These are great sources of calcium. Calcium is a mineral that is uh, present in, in planet Earth. And we can get it from the same sources that a cow gets it. So we can just get it from green leafy vegetables, which are a fantastic source of this uh, wonderful uh, mineral called calcium. But in addition uh, to this, uh, to protein, there are a number of other things that soy has great advantages with. So it doesn't really have a very rich source of uh, absorbable carbohydrate, but it has something called stachyos, which feeds our gut microbiome, uh, which effectively then produces short chain fatty acids, which improve the signaling and absorption of calcium. So there are lots of things um, that one can include in their diet, but I would certainly recommend soya as uh, an important source, but legumes overall, green leafy vegetables, and uh, you know we, we can get our calcium from a number of these sources as we just discussed. So they're asking, can osteoporosis be reversed? Um, once you get osteo, I mean, osteoporosis, firstly, uh, I mean, our maximum bone stock that you see in most people is between 25 and 35 years. Uh, and that's when we, when our bone mass is at its peak. Um, so when you say reversal of osteoporosis, 
um, what we what we are trying to say is that our bone becomes stronger. So we can certainly work to prevent any bone loss from this age onwards. But let's say we're at an older age. So let's say we're fifties or in our sixties and we've lost uh, our bone mass as a result of menopause, we can still make stronger bone. I think one of the tests that is often quite misleading in this regard is a DEXA scan because a DEXA scan causes a lot of anxiety when we see the results of a DEXA scan. And for that reason, on the National Health Service in the UK, we don't, we are not able to get a DEXA scan unless there's a really good reason to do it. But I think you can improve um, your osteoporosis in the sense osteoporosis is really only a problem if you get a fracture. So it's not a painful condition, but when you get a fracture, obviously you can get pain from it. So what you can do is make your bones a whole lot stronger by consuming a better diet as we just discussed earlier, eating a lot more fruit and vegetables, which are actually alkaline and help in bone formation uh, besides the kind of foods that we just discussed. And submitting our body to resistance training or exercise. So anti-gravity exercises, so lifting weights, um, wearing a weighted jacket or wearing a wristband uh, that has some lead in it uh, and taking a walk, running, jumping, skipping, even using a whole body vibration uh, exercise. So uh, I, I mean, we have a little, uh, uh, vibration uh, platform that we can stand on, but you can also do weights on it. So it's called stacked exercises and that builds up your bone. So even if it doesn't effectively reverse osteoporosis, your chances of getting a fracture as a result of the, uh, the osteoporosis that you have are much decreased. So I think the bottom line is you can improve the outcome of osteoporosis uh, and you needn't have to worry about suffering the consequences of getting a fracture um, by changing your lifestyle, by eating a healthier diet and, uh, and doing more weight bearing exercise. Thank you. And when you were talking about sciatica, Yvonne posted a question about what causes the disc to slip to create it? That's a, that's a very good question. And um, I think if you talk to most surgeons or physicians, they will tell you it's just bad luck. Uh, and it's just one of those things that happens. Um, I mean, a lot of things uh, we think are down to genetics and so on. And I used to think it was all down to the aging process of the spine. But in fact, you see a disc prolapse commonly in younger people nowadays. So you see it in ages like 25 to 35. And yes, degenerative changes are a problem, but like I said earlier, a lot of the issues are to do with blood supply around uh, the disc. Now the disc itself is an avascular structure, which means it doesn't really have a blood supply. So the disc gets its nutrition by diffusion through the end plate of the vertebra. So the, the, the bony bit of the vertebra that is adjacent to the disc the blood supply of that area dictates how well nourished the disc is. So there are a no number of issues that affect the reasons why a disc will become degenerate. In other words, it loses its elasticity and, and therefore is more prone to prolapsing or coming out. One of them being lack of good blood supply to the area, which can affect any artery. So, if you eat a healthier plant-based diet and you're consuming plenty of kale and other greens that uh, supply the nitrites to your arterial walls, the blood supply to that end plate is good and therefore the nutrition to the disc is good. Admittedly, about three to 5% of genetics does play a role. So in other words, if your parents have had a degenerative disc disease or a disc prolapse in the past, you are probably three to 5% more likely to get it. But by improving your diet, by getting more active, doing more exercise and improving the blood supply to that area and strengthening your back. I think 
one of the things that is under regarded is the fact that some of the oblique abdominal muscles that we have in the front and the spinal muscles that we have at the back here act effectively as a corset. So you have muscles around the front and muscles at the back that provide support to the spine. So if we are active and if we're doing resistance training and strengthening of the back muscles, something that you learn in Pilates or yoga as core strengthening, that actually supports your spine and prevents it from getting damaged as, as is what happens in a slipped disc. So all these measures go a long way in preventing people from getting a slipped disc. I think one of the big changes that occurred since we went into the industrial revolution and thereafter is the fact that a lot of us sit for long periods of time and sitting definitely puts more pressure on your discs and you're more prone to getting a slipped disc. So therefore, labor laws all over generally su suggest that you should get up uh, every 50 minutes and have a little stroll around at least just to get the circulation going. Sitting for long periods of time has occurred during lockdowns and the, the pandemic that has just, just gone on uh, has resulted in a lot of people either sitting on very bad chairs at home, such as uh, the dining table chairs, which really don't have much of a support and not taking frequent breaks and not exercising enough that has resulted in, in an epidemic proportion of people coming out of the woodwork with back problems since the pandemic started. Is there a special chair you'd recommend? Um, I, I don't have any ties with the company, but the chair I'm sitting on is a, a very popular chair. It's called the Herman Miller chair. Uh, it, has, uh, it has certain contours. So for instance, if you look at the lower back, it has, uh, uh, we, we all have what we call a lumbar lordosis. So you have a curvature of that kind. So as long as your chair supports the natural curvatures of your spine uh, and is comfortable to sit on, um, it is excellent. But as a back surgeon, I invested uh, in a Herman Miller chair, which is uh, one of the more expensive ones, but it's worth it just not to get back pain. Absolutely. Here's a, a, a good question. What complications do you most frequently see for patients who have had hip, knee, or spine surgery? I'm having TKR in August. Any advice on how to prepare? I think um, one of the key ways you can prepare is certainly um, get into the best shape of your life before you have the surgery. So if you're carrying any excess weight, try and lose it beforehand. Uh, for people who smoke, for instance, even cessation of smoking is, is a fantastic thing to do before the operation. Your surgeon will be grateful. Your chances of getting a complication such as a deep vein thrombosis or a clot in your leg veins is much less. Of course, your risks of infection will also go down. But one of the key things to prepare for any kind of surgery nowadays is to follow a program and your surgeon or your physician will often advise you. But we believe that prehab, or we used to call it rehabilitation after the operation, but before the operation to do what is called prehab is an excellent thing to do. So if you work, for instance, on your quadriceps muscle and strengthen it as much as possible, the results of your knee replacement will be much better. Also, try and get more active. Try and do as much strengthening work around the muscles because once you have a painful operation, uh, it'll, it'll require all the muscular reserve that you built up before the operation to do the work that you need to do after. If you can maintain your range of movement uh, that you have, right now or increase it before you have the operation. Again, that's a plus because in general, whatever movement you have before you have surgery, you will at least preserve that after you've had the operation. Great, thank you. Elizabeth wants to know, what is your opinion on the DEXA scan? Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, I, I, uh, I think it's a great test. It isn't an accurate measurement of bone density. 
In fact, it is uh, measured as an aerial measurement. So in other words, it's a two dimensional, it measures the density in an area of bone. So it is often related to the machine. So it has to be standardized properly. Um, the, the, if you go to one DEXA scanner at a particular laboratory or um, office, and you go to another DEXA scanner, you may get completely different values. So it's best to have a follow-up result on the same scanner. I think one of the important things to realize is that it is, a, it is as good as we have as a commonly available test. It's fairly cheap to do, even in the United States, I think you can probably get a DEXA scan done for another, probably about $100. Here it's about the same kind of cost or cheaper. Um, but it's important to use it only when indicated. And here we tend to reserve it for the older patient, either with a family history of problems, earlier menopause, or if they've had what we describe as a fragility fracture. So in other words, somebody who's fallen from standing height and has had a fracture either of the wrist, of the spine or the hip, they are people who would automatically get a DEXA scan. But what is happening increasingly, I see, is that younger people unnecessarily worry about it, especially slim young ladies may get a DEXA scan because they've fractured their ankle, for instance. An ankle fracture is a result of a traumatic incident where you've twisted your ankle and you've therefore had a fracture of the ankle is really not an indication for a DEXA scan. So DEXA scan is still useful, but it shouldn't, first of all, um, if you're told you're osteopenic or osteoporotic, it shouldn't set off alarm bells. It should tell you that you probably need to do more resistance exercise and follow a healthier diet that we've discussed all along on, on Chef AJ's um, YouTube channels. But really that it's, it's just a sign that you probably uh, need to build stronger bones and need to do more weight bearing exercise and strengthen your muscles and your, your bones. Um, so in that sense, it's a great test, but in general, we tend to do it in older people here. So people above the age of 65 or 70. Uh, and of course, if they've had a fracture that we think uh, reflects the osteoporosis that they may have. Great. We have a lot of questions on calcium supplements. Uh, Sharon asks, what do you think about women with osteoporosis and breast cancer metastases to the spine taking a biphosphonate, taking biphosphonate and 1200 milligrams of calcium daily? And someone else was diagnosed with that and was wondering if they should be taking calcium. Okay. I think this is this. Uh, thank you for those questions. I mean, those are particularly good questions because um, I go to India frequently and I see almost everybody who's above the age of 60 is on some kind of calcium supplement. So uh, osteoporosis, first of all, is not a calcium deficiency state. It really isn't. Calcium is just one of the minerals that is necessary for good strong bones. And in general, as we discussed with a healthy plant-based diet, you will easily hit your requirement of calcium. I know in the United States, there's a, there's a very high uh, recommended daily allowance or recommended nutrient intake of calcium, which is 1,200 milligrams. It's a bit of a mystery to most other people all over the world why it's so high in the US. And I think, I mean, I've looked into this in some detail, but I think, for instance, in the United Kingdom, it's 700 milligrams. So it's much less calcium requirement as such. And on a healthy plant-based diet, as we discussed, if you have calcium set tofu or you have calcium um, uh, rich um, plant-based milks that are, uh, uh, you know, supplemented with, uh, that are enriched with calcium, you can, you can easily hit that target of 700. 1,200, a little more difficult, I would say, but still achievable quite easily on a whole food plant-based diet. So what then is the role of 
a supplement of calcium. So that is elemental calcium that you're taking as a tablet. I would say there's a very little role and there have been some studies that have caused quite a lot of alarm. There was a study from New Zealand by uh, two scientists, you can look this up. They're called Boland and Reed. Uh, and they looked at a much higher incidence of cardiovascular problems. So in, in other words, of myocardial infarction in people who took a calcium supplement. And the protection wasn't increased if they took vitamin D or vitamin D in addition to the calcium. So it's a big problem if you have elemental calcium. I think it's a very reductionist way of looking at osteoporosis as a condition. And as I said, osteoporosis is not a calcium deficiency state. Calcium is just one of the minerals amongst many others, um, you know, which are required for healthy, strong bones. And if you get it from a whole food source, such as a whole food plant-based diet, um, with some enriched sources of, uh, let's say, soy milk uh, or calcium uh, set tofu, you're in a much better position because those are much smaller doses of calcium that are uh, being put into your dietary system for absorption. So in general, I wouldn't recommend uh, uh, elemental calcium as a supplement, unless there's a really good reason for seeing it, always consult your physician or surgeon. And I think people should be aware it's much better to get your calcium from real food uh, rather than to get it as a tablet. Uh, in answer to the bisphosphonate issue, I think a lot of people are put on bisphosphonates when they are diagnosed to have osteoporosis. It's a very popular drug. Um, and what it does effectively, it stops a certain cell in your bone called an osteoclast. Osteoclasts take down bone. So in other words, they destroy old bone. Um, and one may wonder why this is important. If it does stop osteoclastic activity, it will, of course, increase your bone strength and in fact, your bone mineral density will go up on a DEXA scan. But is it really good for your bone? Osteoclasts take away old bone and osteoblasts lay down new bone. There's a constant balance between osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity. And this is really quite important to understand that we actually replace our skeleton every 10 years. Um, it's quite difficult to think of this, for instance. I mean, there's no blood vessel seen. It looks like a white calcium rich structure. But in fact, this is live tissue. There's a lot of blood vessels in it. It's a live breathing normal tissue. And if you, um, if you use something like a bisphosphonate indiscriminately, it does stop osteoclastic activity, but that means that you're just storing up your old bone. You're not allowing your old bone to be dissolved and not generating new bone as a consequence. So I think bisphosphonates have a valuable role. They do certainly have a role if, you're, if you've had a fracture in particular. So if you've had an osteoporotic fracture, your doctor or your physician may choose to put you on a bisphosphonate, which, which improves your ability to resist further fractures. So in other words, let's say somebody fell on their wrist and got a wrist fracture. Um, it's a good idea, I think, to put them on a bisphosphonate if they're in the postmenopausal category, especially, and if they have osteoporosis, because it could prevent a more serious fracture, such as a hip fracture or a spinal fracture from a trivial fall. So in those people, it's a great drug. Uh, but it does come with its own side effects. And there are people who can have uh, loose teeth. It does cause osteonecrosis of the mandible. So it can, it can damage your jaw. Uh, and in people who have dental problems, it's a, it's a bit of a disaster. Um, and also people shouldn't be on it for life. So it's usually people who are on it for about five years, and then they have to stop it and give themselves a break so that osteoclastic activity can start. But as I said earlier, it's important 
to balance out the osteoclastic activity by stimulating the bones, that, the cells that actually make bones. So in other words, osteoblast. And for that, you have to do some form of weight bearing exercise. So such as skipping, jumping, running, even walking doesn't really increase your bone strength. It preserves it. So it's a great exercise for older people because they obviously need that stimulation. Uh, but if you want to increase your bone strength, it's better to walk with a weighted jacket or using a wrist or an ankle strap that you get, which are weighted down. And that stimulates your osteoblast to increase. You, you mentioned weight-bearing exercises. I'm curious, my preferred form of exercise is spinning. I spin for an hour a day, but I only stand. I don't ever sit on the bike and I have it at the highest level I can. Is that at all weight-bearing since I'm standing while spinning? Uh, that's an excellent question. And I wish I could answer you with, uh, with definite uh, view on that. In general, if you look at cyclists, um, cyclists, yeah, one of the problems with exercise is we all do what we really like. Uh, and some of us just don't like doing certain things. So swimming and cycling, for instance, are not considered weight bearing exercise. But I think spinning, if you're standing up, as you say, it probably does involve a certain amount of anti-gravity effort. Uh, and as long as there's a joint reaction force um, you are probably contributing to some amount of exercise uh, of resistance. Um, also, I think if, if you're on an exercise, a static exercise bike, for instance, you can ramp up the resistance quite a bit. And that does stimulate your muscles and your joints. So I would say there's an element of resistance built in there. And therefore, they would stimulate your osteoblast too. No, that'd be good because you're right. I do what I like and I don't do what I don't like. But I will say that my legs are huge. I mean, huge in a muscular way because when people say, oh, you're so petite, but then you see my bottom half, I've been spinning for so long. It's so, I mean, they're. I think that'll stand you in good stead as we get older. It's important to, and the shares eyes talk about this. I, that's why I do um, it because they said it was the leg, the leg muscles. And I'm like, well, good. Because those are the absolutely. ones that I have. It's, 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 it's really important and nobody towards the, the latter end of their lives say, I wish I hadn't trained my legs so much. Uh, you know, the, it's vanity that people, especially young people work on their upper body a lot more, but I think it's legs that carry you through the, the latter bit of your life. So definitely all for strong legs. Great, thank you. Thank you for the affirmation. Uh, Gail says, what do you think about taking vitamin K supplements along with D3? Is this helpful for a woman diagnosed with osteoporosis? And what are your thoughts on vitamin bone grow bone supplement? Um, I, uh, I'll take the first bit first because um, I, I don't think I understood the second question, but um, I think vitamin K, it's still unclear as to its definite role in bone metabolism. There are two elements to vitamin K. Vitamin K actually comes from the German name for coagulation is spelt with a K. So it's an important vitamin for blood to coagulate as such. But vitamin K1, which is Philoquinone is, uh, is present in a lot of brief, uh, leafy green vegetables. So kale, for instance, is rich in uh, vitamin K1. And that is a cofactor. So it, it acts as one of the enzymes that is responsible for carboxylation of a mineral in the bone called osteocalcin. So it's certainly very important. I think you can get enough from your um, if you're eating a lot of leafy greens and in particular kale, uh, which is a superfood, um, uh, uh, I mean, like, like most of the greens, it's an excellent source of uh, vitamin K1. K2, on the other hand, has a, a less defined role, I would say. Um, and it's, it's less commonly seen in plant foods, but it's, it's seen, for instance, in foods such as natto, and I don't know whether anybody in, in this group would have tried natto. Natto is a fermented soy food that is um, 
that is very popular in some areas of Japan. Uh, and it's, it's supposed to be an excellent food. I have to say, I tried it in Singapore and uh, it tastes um, absolutely revolting. I don't think I could adopt that into my plant-based diet. Uh, but it's also seen in other, um, other foods that are fermented, for instance, sauerkraut or kimchi. So I think those are valuable foods. And one of the main roles of vitamin K2 is the fact that it does help in preventing um, this ectopic uh, calcification that we talked about. So if you're taking uh, uh, a calcium supplement as a tablet, for instance, um, then if you take vitamin, if you eat a lot of kimchi or natto or um, sauerkraut, it will prevent this calcium from getting into your arterial walls and causing uh, atherosclerosis. So it is protective of bone also in that sense, but it, it really prevents calcium from being deposited elsewhere and focuses it on bone. So I think it's a good thing to take along with vitamin D3 um, and uh, is, uh, is recommended. Great, thank you. Faith wanted to know what you thought about rebounding in general and specifically for building bone density. Um, I, um, uh, I have to say, Faith, I'm not sure what the term rebounding means. Uh, perhaps it's, a, it's like a trampoline, but it's for home use. And so instead of being big and outdoors, it's it's smaller and round. And sometimes it has a bar. And I get it. Yeah. Jump up and down. I think, uh, yeah, we have a different term for that here. I can't remember what it is. But like any other jumping exercise, anything that you kind of hit your bones with, that stimulates the, it really does stimulate the osteoblast. So any kind of activity such as trampolining, um, burpees, skipping, jumping, uh, you know, my wife Nitu, who you met last week, she often jumps before she gets into the shower, she does 10 jumps on the spot, star jumps, anything of that kind will stimulate your bone from getting, uh, and make it stronger. So. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think that's a good addition to any spectrum of exercises. And talking a little bit about exercise, I think doing a number of different exercises is the best way to really prevent osteoporosis. And even things that improve your balance, for instance, so Tai Chi, for instance, does improve balance. Um, and just practicing quite simply, getting out of a chair, without holding the side supports on a regular basis. Um, I think if you can leap out of your chair in your 70s or 80s, you really don't have to worry about osteoporosis. Your legs are strong, your muscles are strong. You can rise out of a chair, you're pretty independent, and you shouldn't really have any of the complications that people get as a result of osteoporosis. Terrific, thank you. Uh, Catherine asks, you mentioned spinal stenosis as a common diagnosis. What do you recommend for patients to do to help themselves? Okay, that's a good question, Catherine. Thank you. So spinal stenosis, um, in the vast majority of people, it can present um, without any symptoms. So in other words, it is quite often an incidental finding. Um, so it's a slow process whereby just because, um, you know, some people are of course uh, constitutionally narrow. So in other words, the spinal canal in them is smaller. Uh, and that's because of the way they were built or formed. And they can't really help that. But in the vast majority of people, it is the joints at the back, the facet joints that start getting a little bit arthritic. So they get into a bone on bone situation and that bone grows inwards onto the nerves. The ligaments that surround the area actually get thicker and you get a narrowing of the spinal canal. The commonest symptom that you would get as a result of this is often back pain, central back pain, but often also radicular pain. So in other words, sciatica-like symptoms going down your leg. But the classic difference with spinal stenosis is that people will say they can walk for a certain distance, but then they look for places to sit down 
or, or they try and flex their spine. So classically, if they go around the supermarket, for instance, they would lean on the supermarket trolley. So if you go to Walmart, you're leaning on your trolley, you probably have spinal stenosis. Um, what can you do to improve it or prevent the problems? Well, if you eat an anti-inflammatory diet, as is recommended uh, with the whole food plant-based diet, if you keep your weight optimum, and if your BMI is at the kind of level which, uh, which is right for the spine and doesn't really stress it, a lot of people do not actually get overarching symptoms of spinal stenosis. In addition to this, I think if you build up the core muscles that we talked about, so the abdominal, oblique abdominal muscles and the back muscles that actually provide integrity to the spine, it supports the spine and makes it stronger. Um, then for instance, just doing a simple exercise such as the plank, um, which is uh, literally resting on your elbows with your body parallel to the floor will strengthen your core quite a bit. Swimming is an excellent exercise for strengthening your core, but any amount of weight training will also have an impact on strengthening your core. All these things will improve your ability to fight the symptoms of spinal stenosis. Great. Uh, Ivan says, what about when osteoporosis is in late, late stages? When I exercise, I fracture. Uh, that is a problem. I'm afraid um, that, is, that is unfortunately a, 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 you know, a very advanced situation where if you exercise and you get fractures, I think that is a real problem. So I think in such a situation, one would have to look at medications such as bisphosphonates that we talked about. Your physician or your doctor would be better placed to advise you on that. If you're fracturing by doing more vigorous exercise, then obviously that isn't for you, but you must try and do whatever level of activity you can. So even walking a little bit, uh, doing as much walking as you can to preserve your bone stock to where it is. And even though you can't probably do a lot of these strenuous anti-gravity exercises, you could probably do some simpler things that don't actually cause the fractures. But that is often the situation which requires treatment in the modern world. And there's very little one can do to prevent um, or improve your bone strength when you're getting regular fractures. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Gail asks, oh, excuse me, Cindy asks, how does menopause affect osteoporosis? That's an excellent question. Thank you, Cindy. So um, menopause just means that you are losing the protection of your hormones, in particular estrogens. Uh, and it's commonly between the ages of 45 and 55. Um, now, men don't have such a menopause, as we can say. So we don't really have that loss of a particular hormone uh, at that age. So at that age, when you lose the protective effect of estrogens on bone, you can lose as much as 3 to 4% of your bone mass. So your calcium mass, which is 99% of the calcium that we have in our body is actually stored in our skeleton and in our teeth. So you lose three to 4% in the very first year around menopause. So I think that's a critical period that um, as it is, you're going through some pretty miserable events. You may have these hot flushes, you're struggling to take control of your life. And on top of it, you're losing your bone stock. And um, what uh, most people would advise is you somehow should increase your level of activity, which is very difficult considering you're fighting that battle on, on so many fronts. But it is important at that stage to, I think, start taking much more in the way of uh, uh, these phytoestrogens that we talked about, so a uh, soya, rich diet, for instance, would be good around menopause. In fact, if you started earlier in life, the kind of healthy, healthy um, gut flora that you cultivate as a result of having soya products 
will stand you in good stead around menopause because you probably will, will have stronger bones around that time. But doing more weight-bearing exercise, doing any kind of running activity will also improve your menopausal symptoms. But that is that, unfortunately, critical period when you can lose a very significant percentage of your bone mass. So it's really quite important to, uh, to, to be as active as you possibly can, given the fact that you might be having some pretty miserable mood swings, hot flushes, and a variety of other things going on at that very moment. Thank you. Here is a question from Randy. I had a torn meniscus and I had surgery three weeks ago, slow recovery. I'm whole food plant-based weight is good, but I do have bad vascular problems in my legs. Would that cause a slow recovery? Knee feels worse now than before. So it, uh, I presume, I, I don't know what your age is, Randy, but I, I presume in most people, a meniscus is cut out. So I take it uh, if, if the meniscus was resected, uh, then really all you're doing is getting over the operation. If on the other hand, your meniscus was repaired, in other words, it was stitched together, and that is, that is quite rare for people to get at an older age. It's more common in younger people where we have um, some vascularity. It's, it's called, uh, you know, if you're repairing the peripheral portion of the cartilage or the meniscus that has torn, then uh, that can heal by itself. So even if you have generalized vascular issues, as long as there's some blood supply to the meniscus, it'll heal. You might be feeling quite awful at this present point in time, but in general, that's an operation that is reasonably commonly done and most people would make a good recovery. So hopefully you will get over this acute phase soon. Great, thank you. Let's see, there's so many questions. Um, for bone health, do greens need to be cooked for more bioavailability? Um, I think it, it depends. Uh, I think greens in, uh, really can be cooked in or eaten raw. I mean, um, it depends on what you prefer and what your choice is. I think as long as you consume uh, a large amount of greens, it's really not a problem. I think certain, certain greens I prefer personally, uh, and remember that when you talk about greens, spinach is unfortunately not a good source of calcium. And that's because it is very rich in oxalates. So I think if you vary your greens, and if you use, for instance, arugula um, uh, rocket leaves are a great source of calcium, uh, they are obviously eaten raw more often than anything else. Kale can be eaten either raw in a smoothie or, or cooked. Uh, and it depends on your choice and whatever your taste fancies. But having it with a little bit of balsamic vinegar uh, or some form of vinegar will enhance the, the nitrite uh, activity in, in the greens uh, and will also enable your vascular system to get the full benefits. So, um, cook them, eat them raw, whatever you, you fancy, but as long as you consume a large number of greens, it's excellent for your bone health. Right, so by any greens necessary. Indeed. <laughs> yep. um, Shar says, how do you feel about drug therapy for osteoporosis and at what point do you recommend it? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we touched upon bisphosphonates, which was one of the drugs. Um, uh, and bisphosphonates, I would generally say if somebody's had one fracture or uh, is, is very severely osteoporotic and you're worried that they're heading towards getting a fragility fracture, and a fragility fracture are really fractures that occur when people fall from a standing height. So there's no uh, mechanism as such that should, I mean, normally if you slip and fall, uh, from a standing height, you shouldn't break one of these three areas. So one is the wrist, the other is your spine, uh, and the third is around your hip. So these are the classic fragility fractures. And if you've had one of them and you are osteoporotic on a DEXA scan, then I think 
it's quite important to consider using a bisphosphonate or some other bone protective medication. The other one that's, that's popularly comes into question is about HRT. Uh, HRT in itself, there are a number of indications and it's better you consult your physician uh, who, who may choose to put you on it. Um, I think most people go on to it because of the terrible effects that they get around menopause, um, mood swings, uh, you know, hot flushes, uh, inability to sleep, um, loss of appetite, really feeling quite miserable. Those are the common reasons why people are put on HRT. Um, and that is definitely beneficial for bone. Uh, and I think if you, if you reach your menopause a little too early, and let's say before the age of 45, I think there's a good reason to consider uh, using HRT, which uh, I think the, the risks that are thought of in terms of uh, causing breast cancer or ovarian cancer, they're really overstated at times. Um, but you need a doctor's advice, which is individually tailored to your own risk profile. So those are the two common drugs. There are other drugs that are sometimes used, such as Teriparatide, for instance, which is a parathormone uh, or parathyroid hormone derivative. Um, and vitamin D, you should really make sure that you get enough vitamin D. Um, and I think people who are known to have osteoporosis should definitely get their vitamin D levels checked in case they're low on that. Um, as I said, you can get it by exposure to sunlight, especially if you are um, if you have white skin, if you're Caucasian, uh, but some people do struggle to to absorb to make vitamin D um, if they have darker skin or they're they're pigmented, and even people uh, Caucasians who slap on a lot of sunscreen, for instance. So SP fifteen is a popular sunscreen, which is strongly recommended, of course, because you don't want to get skin cancer. And if you have skin cancer, there's absolutely no doubt you need sunscreen. But if you're going out in the sun, it's a common practice to slap on sunscreen well before you go out into the sun, uh, which means you really don't get that vitamin D from your ultraviolet rays converting 7D uh, hydrocholesterol in your skin to vitamin D3 that is active ultimately. So I think it's a good practice to just put on SP15 or whatever form of uh, sunscreen just before you step out into the sunlight and expose your back of uh, your, your, your arms or your legs uh, to the sunshine. You don't want to really expose your, fain, uh, your face because that causes aging and wrinkles on your skin. So um, just remember that and you can get plenty of vitamin D generally in the summer months in particular. Good, thank you so much. You know, I was so busy looking at the chat, I forgot that there were so many questions that were already submitted, so let me get to those. The first one is from Sheba. How does a woman know if she is experiencing higher than expected bone loss during or after menopause without the use of scans? Are there any at-home or non-invasive measurements and should thin women do more strength training than women of a normal weight or overweight after menopause? Both excellent questions. I think the answer to the first one is, I don't think there's a simple um, method of seeing whether you're losing bone mass around menopause. But I think in general, if you're losing weight, um, it does cause concern that some of it may be bone mass. I mean, they're simple, laboratory tests, so uh, a telo and telopeptide measurements in your urine can tell you if your bone uh, is being catabolized, so it's being destroyed by your menopausal symptoms. Um, the other question is much more nuanced, and I'll get into that a little bit. So um, funnily enough, this is probably the only condition which thin people have to fear a little more than people who are slightly more overweight or in the normal BMI range. We know that people who, or women in particular, who have uh, a BMI that is less than 22 are more prone to the effects of osteoporosis. So I think in answer to that, 
I certainly think you shouldn't worry, you shouldn't really start overeating to get uh, uh, the complications of carrying excess fat in your body, but you probably should start doing more resistance training because as we know, muscle is about 18% more dense than fat. And that is much better at preserving bone. So um, if you put on more muscle at that stage when you're menopausal and you're slim, I think it's a much greater advantage to prevent osteoporosis. It's a myth that very overweight people who are carrying a lot of excess fat actually have stronger bones. They don't, and there is good reason for that. Um, one of the reasons is, of course, the fact that um, excess visceral fat in particular is very inflammatory. So you're in a constant state of inflammation uh, that actually suppresses your bone tissue from forming. So it's not really good for that. There's also some theories that uh, suggest, or some, some papers that have suggested that uh, adipose tissue can take away the active forms of vitamin D or vitamin D and sequester it in the fat. So you have a lower active form of vitamin D. So your bone protection is lost. Um, on the plus side, it is thought that people who are carrying excess weight or uh, fat around their hips in particular, when they fall, they have a cushioning effect of the fat. Um, but I think there are far greater disadvantages of being uh, in excess weight. So the ideal sort of uh, BMI to, to look at is around 22 or more, and most of it being lean mass uh, rather than, than fatty weight. So in other words, visceral fat as low as possible and muscle mass as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, this is from Ginny. Uh, you, you might have answered this uh, in general, but she's specifically saying, what do you recommend for hip osteoarthritis? I follow an SOS-free whole food plant-based diet. I do yoga and walk 10,000 steps every day. I had already one hip replaced and I'm trying to avoid replacing the other. Is there anything I can do to address the pain and the stiffness? Um, uh, another good question, but uh, I'm afraid if osteoarthritis has already set in and you have a degree of inflammation there, I think the best thing you can do is really keep your weight uh, optimum and to maintain as much movement as you can within the joint. So sometimes um, doing non-weight bearing exercises in that situation or what we call closed chain exercises. So Cycling, for instance, is a closed chain exercise. Um, you did say that you were walking 10,000 steps, but in fact, walking does put a little more pressure on the hip joint. So I would suggest swimming or uh, a cycle, an exercise bike is a better exercise. Also trying to maintain your range of movement as much as possible. But unfortunately, if you're getting to the stage where it is extremely painful, to your day-to-day -day life and it's waking you up, let's say in the middle of the night, then I think you should consult your surgeon. Uh, and uh, as you probably recognize from having had one hip operation, that it is, it is probably the second best operation in the world. I mean, uh, considering that cataract surgery, for instance, that restores your eyesight is thought of uh, as being the best operation for quality of life improvement a hip replacement is actually the second best, uh, best operation that one can have. Very, very successful in improving your pain and your disability. Great, thank you. Here's a question from Joan. I'm postmenopausal female, recently had a bone density evaluation eating whole food plant-based for past six years. My left hip T-score is minus 2.9 and my Z-score is minus 1.5. My lumbar spine scores are T-score minus 3.2 and Z-score 1.6. My doctor is strongly recommending Boniva. Do I have other options? And I'm curious, do you ever do uh, virtual consultations when people have very specific questions like this? <laughs> yes, we, we started doing that uh, actually over... Um, over lockdown, uh, when we started doing a much more 
uh, sort of virtual clinics uh, and discussing some things. Obviously, with with just an investigation, it's difficult to get a full picture of what uh, Joan is going through. But it does sound like she has a fairly severe osteoporosis and is concerned about it. Um, I think it's important that you don't forget that <clears throat> at any stage, as long as you've not had a fracture, you can improve your bone strength. And every day is a day in, in terms of progressing towards that goal. So I don't know how much exercise you do, Joan, but if you were to step it up a little bit, uh, and if you're, let's say, walking 2,000 steps a day, um, because osteoporosis is not a painful condition until you have a fracture, I would recommend you just step that up. Maybe you could add on some extra weight. So you, you, if your spine hasn't had a fracture and you're you're on the uh, you know you're on the severe side of osteoporosis, you could probably wear a weighted jacket which you can buy um, uh, in a lot of places and you can get it online. Uh, and wear a wristband, maybe just do some simple exercises using a resistance band or lifting some simple weights or even doing some simple sit-ups uh, or exercising your legs uh, as Chef AJ talked about uh, spinning or you know, using a static bike with a greater resistance. So there are lots of things that you can do that won't necessarily change your bone density very much. So when you get a repeat scan, you may feel disappointed. You're still minus 2.9 or minus 3.2 in various areas, but it doesn't really matter. Your proneness to getting fractures will decrease. And that is what is important. You really don't want to get a fracture. And if your doctor is suggesting you should go on a bone protection medication, um, I would probably take that advice if he's if he's got your full picture in mind. Uh, as I say, I don't have the full picture in front of me here. I don't know uh, how you know how you are in the rest of your attitudes towards exercise. Uh, I'm always one to avoid medication in general, especially if it has side effects, uh, and we can do things to help ourselves first. If somebody did want to book a private consultation, just go to your website. That link is in the show notes. That's correct. Yes. Great. Happy Thank you. Well. You're so knowledgeable. Uh, Susan wants to know, can an older woman with hip osteoporosis safely use a rebounder? And is there a way to reverse that condition without resorting to dangerous medications? It sounds like no is to the second part of the question, but we didn't mention whether or not you could use a rebounder if you had osteoporosis. I think it depends on the severity of osteoporosis. So rather than a rebounder, I may start with a whole body vibration exercise device. And that by that, I mean, I mean, you can get a variety of them. I have something called a Casada power plate. Uh, but as long as you have a lot of vibrations, uh, it does simulate your osteoblasts. And if you lift a few light weights, I mean, whatever you can get, you know, a three pound, five pound weight, uh, and you hold them and you just stand on the vibration platform, that would be a good way of subjecting your bone to some degree of exercise. And then possibly moving on to a rebounder if you had no unfortunate events. I, I think we over worry about the fact that we have uh, a DEXA scan reading uh, that is a little bit alarming. I think at any stage, as long as you've not had a fracture and not getting repeated fractures, you can certainly aim to strengthen your bones with regular exercise. Thank you. Uh, Clark said if you could specifically say which Herman Miller chair you're referring to, is it Aeron or Mira? Uh, this is an Aeron that I have. Um, I'm very, I've, I've had it for over 10 years now, actually. So there are probably newer and better models, but uh, this, this still works very well for me. Uh, I must say, uh, you know, since following a whole food plant-based diet, I don't sit on a chair for too long. I get restless. Uh, I have uh, some energy to move around. So I think that's more important. Whatever chair you have, you shouldn't really be sitting on it for longer than 50 minutes. 
even if you're engrossed in something that is so important. And I think just standing up and having a little uh, move around and stretching your legs is a good way of relieving the pressure on your back. I am so guilty of that. Okay. <laughs> well, I know I've, ke I, I've kept you long enough and I'm so sorry. You're just such a wealth of information. Just one more quick question and then we'll call it a day. Jordan says, what do you think of collagen supplements? Uh, 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 I think it's one of those, I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary thing that people believe in collagen supplements. I mean, it's been widely dispelled as one of the biggest uh, areas of scams that go on in the supplement market. I mean, a collagen supplement does nothing for you. Ultimately, it's broken down into the constituent proteins and you might as well eat a better healthy protein source. And I think a lot of supplements in general are a good money-making exercise for people who dare to sell them. Um, but really a collagen supplement is, uh, is really not useful uh, as a lot of bone marrow broths are not useful or a lot of these sort of quacking, uh, quackery areas are really not uh, worth the, the money you spend on them. Uh, as Neetu, my wife would say, you know, if you're a woman, then you should probably get a facial and, or a massage. It's much more useful than using a collagen supplement. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Vagical. I really appreciate your expertise, your time, and your passion for a plant-based diet. And if people have more questions, they can certainly book a private consultation with you. And I hope you'll come back sometime. Thank you very much, Chef AJ. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 2 p.m. today when my guest is Jill Dalton from 